your Bibles this morning, we're going to go to prayer and get ourselves centered here this morning. We're going to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 will be where we begin. And uh, It's been a challenging week, I just want you to know. Have you? How many had a challenging week? Just be honest. Did you have a challenging week? Good. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the right room. I'm in the right room then. And uh, I actually, uh, uh, you know, you just have moments where you, you sort of can't wait for the week to end and, uh, and then start again and have another week to do this in. So, but um, it's, it's just been one of those weeks. But let's just, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we pause to thank you in advance for the chaos this next week holds. And we thank you for the struggle that we'll have in dealing with certain things. Mostly, Father, we thank you because you're on the throne and it's not a surprise to you. God, I pray this morning you take our attention and direct it to your word that it might become alive to us. That the change that you require would be evident, clear, and concise That, Lord, we might hear you. Let the words that leave my mouth be your words. And may your church be blessed by it. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Bring in a little background here. The the church is birthed in this chapter. Chapter 2 of Acts is an exciting time. And I think a lot of times the church wants to still kind of live in this moment, in this newness. When you experience something new... We, we don't ever really want it to end. It feels good. It's, it's an exciting time. And, and so it, as Acts two, two, chapter 2 begins, it's the, it's the invitation for the believer to be introduced to the Holy Spirit. It was not that way prior to this. Jesus was present to them in a physical way. And, and so that presence, as real as it was, because Jesus was very tangible to the disciples, they're now sort of dealing with some grievance because he's left. He's now at the right hand of the Father. And so the Holy Spirit, as promised, arrives. And so they're in the upper room, as Jesus had told them to do, go get there and be waiting for the uh, the coming of what was next. I, I, I love it how Jesus, and this is kind of like a parental thing, by the way. You know, God just never really gives us all the details. He leaves some of it up to a surprise, um, and, and more importantly, it just sort of keeps us on edge. And I think that's a great thing. I don't think we need to have all the answers. I don't think we have to know all of the details. And I don't think it's a requirement for us to know what's coming next. Certain things we can predict and certain things we can kind of foresee. But for the most part, God keeps us guessing because it creates a dependency on him. I think we need to remember that we are dependent creatures. We are not independent. As much as we find ourselves to be independent, we are dependent creatures. My family depends on me for a certain amount of things. They depend on uh, other things as far as jobs and responsibilities. We all have dependencies. But the greatest dependency we could possess is one of a dependency on God. Amen? That's a positive thing. We need God to see us through things. And so the disciples are distraught. They're They're discouraged, I I think even questioning, when is this going to come to play? How many of us are still waiting and anticipating what God is going to do next? See, we've been in this church age for how long? And we've been waiting for the coming of Jesus to come and remove us from this place. And as exciting and wonderful that is, we're still waiting. Now, we may not necessarily be in the legitimate physical upper room, but in many ways, that's where we should be, waiting for what is next, preparing for what is next. So in this passage, and we're, we're jumping way towards the end here in verse 46, all of this has already taken place. The power of the Holy Spirit has fell on them. They have now been introduced to the power of the Holy Spirit, something that they only experienced in the presence of Jesus, something that they would have only experienced when God saw it necessary to utilize. Now he was sending the Spirit to serve in a different capacity. And this is exciting because it required change. Now I ask the proverbial question, how many of us love change? 
I don't see a whole lot of hands going up. What's up with that? Change is not always easy, but it's a requirement that God requires us to change. When we come to Jesus Christ as a sinner requiring salvation for the preservation of life for eternity, as Scripture determines, the Bible says that in that transaction we are changed. So right there from the start is a blueprint for our, the rest of our life is to constantly be in change. We have been changing since the day we were born. Do you realize that? Okay, and some points we revert, don't we? We, we go through life and, and then things start to change and we become completely dependent again towards the end of our life. There are things that change and our life is always in motion that way. But this requirement was a change all for the better. And we didn't necessarily see it that way, but this was an exciting time. The Spirit enters through um, this just a wonderful introduction, and they are overwhelmed with the presence and the power that they are now a part of. And the first task at hand was to go and share that. If there's a lesson in this, let's hear in the first one. When we receive Christ, our first transaction of, of being introduced to Christ and receiving him, our first response is to share it. We should share it. So immediately we step out of the position of a sinner now saved by grace and now missionary at large. We're to be invested in the, rep, the, the, the rep, repetition of the gospel. And so now they leave the upper room. They enter into a festival of weeks, at the, the festival of Pentecost. And there's representatives of many nations and languages and dialects. And Peter begins to, to just preach. Peter's sermons in this chapter. And, and you kind of see that through verse 14 on to, you know, kind of about where we're at. Uh, verse 36 is his sermons. So you want to go read that. And so Peter comes out, and have you ever been in one of those moments where you don't know where those words came from, but they just flowed? I, I mean, you just, whoa, I sounded so smart. It was amazing. I've never felt that smart in my whole life, and all this just spewed from my mouth, and that was the Holy Spirit. So now we get down to verse 46. Let's read through this passage here. Verse 42, I'm sorry, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders, and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread and from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now, this is an exciting time. Uh, it's an exciting time because it's the birth of the church. We sit in a building today. We sometimes call this the church. This is the church building. We are the church. We are the individuals that make up the body of Christ. And so when we come together, this is called church. We're in the church age. So while we exist in this church age, these are the examples of the process of a growing and caring church. So then I would ask us to evaluate, are we meeting up to the standard by which we are a growing and caring church? And, and I don't say that corporately at first, but individually. Are we personally, I'm not asking you to evaluate your spouse, your, your, your fellow Christians, anyone else that you might uh, you know, have some encounter with. I'm asking you to evaluate yourself. Are we a caring and growing church? Verse 42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What was the teaching? Anything they had to say that God gave them to say, they were devoted to it. Meaning what? When we come under the authority of the word and whenever and however that takes place, we become devoted to it. That we don't stop 
We don't, we don't give it up. We, well, that was good preacher. That was good Bible study teacher. That was good Sunday school teacher. That was a great study. And we move on. They're devoted to it. Meaning what? There's an action requirement here. That we do more with it than just listen to it. We have to do something more than just hear this word. To be devoted to something means that we take it to heart. We find application. We make changes that are required by it. So when the, when the teaching tells us to stop doing something that is wrong, then we stop doing it. If it tells us to introduce something that is new and outside of our norm, or maybe something we never realized we had to do or even know how to do, we introduce it and we do it and we apply it. I mean, let's be serious. How many times have we had to do something we don't like to do? I hate taking out the trash. I hate it. It's been a job. I hate it, Mom. I hated it. I always had to do it. Take out the trash. Oldest son became my responsibility. Now, I've handed that over, and the torch has been passed on to a tall redhead. And that happens, right? It's a task that has to be done, but I don't want to do it. All joking aside, there are tasks that God gives us that we kind of say the same thing to. I don't want to do it. You know, when we talk about missions, we, we think that it's someone else's responsibility. We think that it's someone else's job. It's their calling. And we've already been down the road. We've already talked in Matthew, and we've talked in Luke, and we've talked about God's great commission to the church, that we're to go and to tell the story. We've even been in the book of Acts in the first chapter talking about how we are all witnesses to what God has done and changed in our life, that we now represent that and it is our challenge and our mandate to do. But there are other tasks that he gives us to do. And so some of those are kind of listed here. He says here that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the understanding of Scripture. Not dependent on the teacher, but found the time to invest in it on their own. They sort of dined on that word. I went to a Christian high school when I was a kid. And I remember there was one of the students that uh, had asked to teach in chapel one, one day, and he talked about dining on the word. And of course, we all were, you know, wonderful Christian students that mocked him from the back row. And we were like, oh, look at Gary. Look at him. Dining on. So we all picked up our Bible and we're all pretending to chew. We're dining on the word. Oh, what a great phrase. It wasn't until later that we recognized that that's a real thing. And he was so profound in that moment, we kind of joked it off. The reality is, is that we don't take the word of God to heart the way that we should because most of us are not only starving spiritually, we are, we are spiritually anemic. We're in a condition that if we ate and lived that way with our food and sustaining life in the normal way, we would be absolutely one foot in the grave if not already there. Because we anticipate this relationship to be contingent on who's pouring into me rather than on what I'm doing. And the heart of missions comes from my willingness to be served. No, the heart of missions is my willingness to serve. It's my willingness to step out and to do something that might be uncomfortable. I got to tell you, Peter, I really identify with him. And the fact that he just got up and they ran out and he became the spokesperson, there was a little bit of Peter's character that kind of made him the center of attention. He, he's the guy that just stepped out of the boat and he was the guy that cut off the ear of the soldier in the garden. And he was always the one, I mean, he, you remember, he was the one, no, Jesus, I love you, I love you. He's kind of that character that sort of found his way into the place that would be normally the right place, but seemed to get in all kinds of trouble when he got there. Peter becomes the spokesperson. The amazing thing is, we get hung up on this too, is that, you know, we, this is the introduction of tongues, which, by the way, just let's illustrate this. The word tongues in this translation is known language. Meaning what? Meaning everyone in that crowd, as Peter was speaking, everyone heard it in their own language. That's a pretty amazing, you know, feat to, to, to accomplish. He had nothing to do with it. He was the vessel. He was the willing one to be used of God in that way. Was it something he, I wrote down in my diary, I'd love to be used of God. I'd love to speak in tongues. 
I want to be the preacher on that day when the church is birthed. He didn't anticipate any of that. But what he did was his willingness. It says here that they were devoted to the teaching, meaning they invested in more than just showing up and expecting someone to do it for them. But then it says here, they were devoted to fellowship. Fellowship's more than Sunday morning. It's more than a donut Sunday, by the way. It's, it's connecting outside of this place. Not just in this place. Fellowship. To interact with one another. Look, look how they fellowshiped here. They, they broke bread. You know what that means. Come on, good Baptists know what breaking bread means. That's, that's not communion. That's food. We're all good about food. You get me started. I start on a Sunday, Sunday morning and my mouth starts watering. And I start thinking about food. The breaking of bread. To sit down and enjoy the sustaining part of our life. We, we, we live in these moments to fellowship, but we also live to eat. So then the last one is to prayer. When was the last time you got with somebody and fellowshiped? When was the last time you got with somebody and, and broke bread? More importantly, when was the last time you got together and just prayed with somebody? I, I just entered into a time of prayer. Well, pastor, I pray for a lot of people. No, no, no. Pray with them. They devoted themselves to prayer, praying with one another. I bet if you had a desperate need, you'd want everybody around you to come in and agree that God would take care of it. True story. But when things are sort of not eventful, things are smooth sailing, things are quiet, we're, we're less apt to get on our face before God. You know, the book of Daniel tells a story how he was told by law they were not allowed to pray to any other God or any other person but to pay homage and respect to the king. And of course, all the trickery that was involved in that story, we know Darius was tricked and, and he signed it and he didn't realize that his friendship with Daniel was in jeopardy and he would have to execute his friend. It didn't stop Daniel from praying. He didn't pray any different the day after the law was passed than the day before. He opened his window, he faced his, his, faced his, his posture towards Jerusalem, and he prayed, and he prayed that way every day, three times a day. And it didn't stop him just because the law had been passed. Nothing got in the way of that. Did you hear me? Nothing got in the way of that. Isn't it funny how things get in the way of our walk? Pastor, I'm so busy, there's so much going on, I got this going on, and, and my kids, and my job, and my responsibilities, and oh my goodness. You know, if, if you miss some of that stuff, is it really the end of the world? But if you miss time with God, can you realize, do you realize how that changes everything? It changes everything. Everyone, verse 43, was filled with awe. They were amazed at this. Because of the wonders and the signs, and I think the church is still looking for wonders and signs, we're missing them because we think a wonder and a sign has to be someone's leg growing or someone's ear being reattached or someone's diabetes disappearing. We think that that's the only sign and wonder that God gives us. But you know what? One of the greatest miracles that takes place on this planet is when an individual who has no idea who God is meets Jesus Christ for the first time and is changed into a new creature, that is the greatest miracle and wonder you could ever see. And yet we're okay with that, and that's wonderful, but we are still looking for all these alterations of life. Scripture doesn't say that everyone's going to get healed. It doesn't say that everybody's going to live prosperous, despite what you see on TV. I, I think we've come to a place in the church, and I don't mean this just centered here in this congregation, but I think in a universal way, we think somehow we have to sell Jesus. I'm probably going to step on toes. I'm going to, my phone's turned off, by the way, so my phone will not ring this morning. But I'm going to get a phone call, and I'm probably going to get an email. Someone's going to get mad. But I think if we have to dress down turn off the lights, add smoke machines and neon to an auditorium so that we can bring in the presence of God, we've missed it. We no longer fear God. We're trying to manipulate him. 
See, the work of the Holy Spirit on the day that Peter and the disciples received him, there wasn't, listen, there, there wasn't the smoke and mirrors. It wasn't manipulation. It was the presence of God. And as an individual Christian, we have the privilege to ask for that. To experience God in a real way. You know, this, this day and age that we live in, we, we've come to, what is real? We've come to a place where we can't even determine what's real and what's fake. I think it's time that we, we stand up and represent Christ well. Our job as believers is not, again, about building this congregation because the increase doesn't come from us. Look, look, jump way down here. Verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people every day who the Lord added to those that were saved. The Lord added. It didn't say Peter did or John or anybody else. It said the Lord added. In the middle section here of this passage, we see where they paid attention. When they came together, they recognized that they were part of a greater family than just their blood relatives. That they saw that there was common ground. And common ground meant that if someone was in need, whatever it took, we as the family took care of it. It said that they sold possessions and properties and they pulled all of their efforts in order to take care of what was needed you know the the steps and that the details are not as important as the greater principle the greater principle is that they paid attention they saw people in their need they saw people where they were we as believers have a responsibility to look up and see people where they're living and what's going on in their life. To judge them, no. To assist them. If one of the greatest failures of the modern day evangelical system was to bring people to Christ, and that was it. It was never to do the steps after. So what do you think the percentage of people that came to Christ but never had someone walk with them through the next steps, are still following the Lord today. Well, look around the room. The great falling away. We, we, we come to Christ, we, we, we receive this incredible gift from God, and then no one tells me what to do next. That's okay, Pastor, we got them saved. They're saved. Now they can, they can be safe from the... The punishment of sin, well, that's not enough. It is enough for Christ, but it's not enough for the journey. I want you to think about somebody that poured into your life. That invested time in praying with you. And when they saw you down, they were, they were there to pick you up. When, when they saw you struggling in your spiritual journey, or they even bothered to check on you and say, Hey, are you doing okay? Are you doing okay? Are, are, are you praying? Are you talking to God? What are you reading in the Bible? What are you studying personally? We're not, we're not asking questions. Oh, pastor, that's not my place. I mean, that's somebody else. That's their personal business. God says, listen, I've incorporated you together as a family so that you can do mission work together. As a body, you're not, you're not strong enough if you're not prayed up. You're not strong enough if you're not in the Word. If you're not devoted to fellowshipping with believers. You know, you love those people. You say, oh, I, I, I'm saved. I just don't like people. What? I don't think those phrases belong together. Don't get me wrong, I know people can be challenging. I get that, you know. But have you ever wondered how challenging you are? Oh no, pastor, I'm wonderful. I'm I'm just I'm just wonderful. It's good. It's good. I don't bother anybody. 
They were devoted to the teachings. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to breaking bread and getting together. But they were devoted to each other in prayer. It meant we checked on in each other. We, we moved in and we invested in one another. How prepared are we to share the gospel if we aren't really being nourished as a body? You know, JBC, we, we have a responsibility to be ready for whatever God puts at our doorstep. But we have to realize that nothing's going to come to the doorstep if we're not out in the community doing anything. If we're not living correctly. We're not walking straight. If we're not living the life that we've been called to do, and that's to live it as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Meaning what? Meaning I look like him. I act like him. I talk like him. Let's just be honest. We have, we have bad weeks, right? We have weeks where we just don't measure up. We have weeks where I second guess what I did and what I should have done. Sometimes that's day to day. But we also have some good weeks too. And what's the difference? If we were to be honest with ourselves, we would say that the difference is, is I, I got in the word more. I spent more time in prayer. The amazing thing is, is that we make all kinds of excuses why we can't do these things, but yet God has given us every excuse in the book to say why we can and why we need to and what's important about this. If we're going to share Christ in this community, if we're going to share Christ with our loved ones and our friends, if we're going to really open our mouth and do this, we've got to be ready ourselves. So it puts us in a position that we, we've got to make some changes. Nobody likes change, I know. I, I'll be honest, I didn't see one hand go up. Was there a hand that went up when I said like change? Because change requires things that we're unfamiliar with. It requires us to do something different from what has become routine and expected. And yet, God says every day we should be changing. I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. What does he say? All things are new. They're new. Every day you have to live on this planet is a day of grace. Every day. I know people that really take that to heart because they face some adversity that could otherwise change things. When I'm able to get up out of bed and stand on my own two feet, I am grateful that I've been given another day. Am I guaranteed the whole day? I'm not guaranteed the next hour. I'm not. Life is in the hands of God. And so I have to take every opportunity that I have to be on mission, to be available. I love it when somebody who I know is outside of faith comes up and say, hey, hey, preacher. By the way, it's a new nickname, I guess, you know. Hey, preacher. You know, my mom's real sick. Could you pray for her? Could you have your church pray for her? I love the look on their face when they say, well, let's pray right now. <gasps> what? Well, yeah, let's, let's do that right now. You can do that? Well, well Sure. Let's not wait. Let's, let's do this right now. There's an expectancy. We don't live like that. Sometimes we think that the I love Jesus shirt, and my favorite shirt, by the way, is don't do that in front of me. You might, might wind up as a, as a sermon illustration. It's my favorite shirt. I need to wear it around my kids. Everything they do becomes public knowledge, right? We can wear the shirt, we can wear the billboard, we can carry the big pulpit Bible. It's not enough. Because it's, it, this is about a gospel conversation. This is about being Christ in this world. Because this world, whether you like to think this way or not, is truly searching for Christ. They just don't know it. They're searching for hope. They're searching for something they can't put their finger on it, but they're looking for it. 
And God has placed us strategically where we're at in order to be available to facilitate the next step for that person. I think of that story we heard this morning earlier. A woman praying for a country she'd never been to but saw it on a map. Had no idea that she, and I believe that's a God thing, that she got to meet the person that she was praying for, didn't even know, and how that affected and how that rippled. Can you think for a moment that your small action of living for Christ in a single moment, standing in a grocery store at a gas pump, becomes something that ripples into people coming to Christ? When Peter left that room and he stepped out onto the street, he didn't come with the expectancy that this is going to start a movement. He just stepped into the moment to be available to be used of God. And when God used him, it wasn't Peter's effort. It was God's work that erupted and rippled into that community. And the amazing thing was that that community had thousands of visitors there for a festival that had nothing to do with the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was a festival they were doing anyway. And so all of these people arrived from other countries. Do you realize what happened on that day when they recognized that they needed Jesus as their Savior? They took it home. You can't see the missional effect. Not standing on the street there. But the ripple that took place. It was huge. One effort. One investment of time. Can make the world of difference. In not just one life. But thousands. You have no idea. I'm a big fan of collegiate missions. I, I think that's a. Uh, an untapped world venue for reaching the world for Christ. We have students from all over the world that come to our colleges and universities here in America. They come for the purpose of education. Collegiate missions serve in an amazing way because when you have missionaries on the ground on a campus introducing Christ to people from foreign nations, Man, the world has been brought to us. The world has been brought to us. We didn't have to travel overseas, but because of our interaction with that person, how does that affect them when they go home? How does that ripple? See, we gave you a simple tool a couple weeks ago, a handful of weeks ago now, a simple card. There's nothing supernatural about it. It's just a simple invitation. Lots of information on that. And all you have to do is give it away. It takes something that didn't cost you a thing. And your investment of time is a split second to just hand that to somebody. Pastor, they're going to throw it away. Then then that's on them. Our investment. We have no idea what God's going to do with that. A simple action. To invite someone to church. To encourage someone to look a little deeper. Because if the world is truly looking for hope, and I truly believe that it it is, they'll go looking for the answer somewhere. And they may not find everything they're looking for, and they might find a lot of conviction, and they might find a lot of reasons why they're angry at a church, and how the church destroyed them, and how they were mean and horrible people, and how there's so many rules to live inside of Christ, but... You don't know what God's doing in their life. You don't know how God's affecting that person. But you hold the key to the possibilities of one person affecting thousands. Because that person that you hand that card to could be a Billy Graham. Could be a Lottie Moon. could be an average Joe living in an average town but making an impact for Christ. We have a responsibility. It's our message. It's our relationship that we're sharing to take one simple moment and invest it for God.